Hello, everyone, and welcome to Source Zero Con. We appreciate you being here with us today, and we hope that you found value both in the topics that you've already viewed and in the content that will be presented over the next couple of days. Also, thank you for being here for my presentation. Today, I want to talk about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart because it's something that I recently lived through, and that is transitioning into penetration testing as a second career. My name is William Giles. I go by Billy. I'm a security consultant on Optiv's attack and pen team. I've been doing this for about a year, and prior to that, I served in the Air Force for 25 years before retiring. Uh, during that time, I had the opportunity to lead and be part of a number of high-performing teams, and I found that that's a passion of mine, is building teams. I also found that I'm passionate about teaching. I had the opportunity to both be an air crew instructor early in my career and then teach some graduate-level courses later in my career, and definitely uh, love teaching. And then finally, I, I consider myself a veteran advocate. You know, as I went through the, the transition process out of the military, I was heavily dependent on folks that had gone before me uh, for lessons and advice and recommendations. And now that I've completed that process, I've made it a goal to help as many people as I can successfully transition out of the military and into whatever it is they choose to do, whether that be penetration testing or another role. During my time in the military, uh, over 25 years, I had kind of three major jobs. Uh, so I enlisted in 1998, spent about six years as an aircraft maintainer, uh, during which time I had some good mentors who encouraged me to, to continue pursuing higher education. And during that time, I was able to, to complete a bachelor's degree, and I decided to pursue a commission as an officer in the Air Force. And in December of 2004, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant, also uh, as a, an air battle manager. Uh, there are a number of different roles that air battle managers fill, fill but for me, I was a, a, an air crew member on the E3 AWACS and basically did kind of an air traffic control function uh, from the air. Uh, I did that for about seven or eight years as well. Uh, started to get migraine headaches and ultimately I was disqualified from flying because of the medication that I was prescribed for, for the migraine headaches. And the Air Force gave me a couple choices for uh, jobs to retrain into, and I selected intelligence. And it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because I had an incredible rewarding remainder of my career as an intelligence officer. And I got the opportunity to work in traditional intelligence, cyber operations, and also in support to special operations. Um, one of those things that I did, and I think it's very formative kind of for, for being here today, was from uh, October of 2018 to December of 2019, I was deployed to Afghanistan. And during the first half of that deployment, I did a, an advisory role and I helped Afghan special ops conduct targeting operations. And then I was asked to move to Bagram and become the director of intelligence for a, a unit called the Information Warfare Task Force. And this unit had the responsibility of countering Taliban messaging in cyberspace. So whether that was social media, traditional media, blocking their access to, to a variety of, of things, um, that was part of the, the job that we did there. And, you know, in about June or July of 2019, we were actually conducting some mission planning for a large named operation that was, uh, the goal of the operation was to shut down a number of routers that, that we knew that the Taliban was dependent on for disseminating social media. We were also doing some, some blocking of some accounts and some other things, some blocking of some, some text messaging. But during that mission planning, I realized that I didn't know nearly as much about cyber operations and tactics, techniques, and procedures as I wanted to. And I kind of resigned at that point that I was gonna learn more. But I also knew that I'd been you know 20 years in the, in the Air Force at that point, and the Air Force wasn't gonna send me to that initial level cyber operator training because it just wasn't realistic. So I did what most of us would do and I, I opened up my laptop and opened up a Google window and typed in learn to hack. And you can imagine I, I got a lot of interesting results back, but one of them was uh, you know, a, a link to the penetration testing with Kali Linux, which is required before testing for the offensive security certified professional certification. But basically that was my first exposure to ethical hacking and penetration testing. And from there, I just decided that I was gonna pursue it and learn how to, to penetration test. So I redeployed back to the US in uh, uh, December of 2019. I bought the course and I started learning. Uh, at that time, I also got hired to be a squadron commander, uh, which is a, you know, uh, an 05 level command equivalent to a battalion commander and other services. But basically at that level of command, you're given a set of resources, people, 
a budget and some some systems and you're charged with uh, executing a mission. So the mission that I had was conducting cyber and intel ops in support of national requirements. I had about 100 people under my command and had a $12 million annual operating budget. And this was probably the best job of my career, but half of that team was uh, about 40 or so hackers that were co-located with one of the three-letter agencies conducting cyber operations, primarily targeting terrorism. And then the other half of the team was doing some pretty cutting edge kind of sock puppet virtual persona operation stuff, uh, basically, you know, trying to catfish terrorists on behalf of the U.S. government. So fantastic opportunity, fantastic job. During that two year period that I was in that job from June of 20 to June of 2022, I also continued to learn how to penetration test. And eventually I got to the point where I, I took and passed the offensive security certified professional certification. And in the spring of 2022, I kind of was at a, a career crossroads. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend the Army's War College in, uh, in Pennsylvania, but that would have meant uh, more time away from my family. At this point, I had spent a lot of time away from my family. And through some soul searching and discussions with my family, we decided that the timing was right to, to leave the military. So I retired from the Air Force and I kind of knew that the only job that I really wanted to do was uh, that of a penetration tester. So I started applying for jobs, and uh, fortunately, I was lucky enough to convince the leadership at Optiv to, to give me a shot and, and let me join the team as a, a consultant. So, you know, it's been almost a year since I kind of went through that process. I've had a lot of time to reflect on some of the lessons I learned, some of the mistakes I made, and just reflect on career change in general. And I wanted to put together this presentation uh, and talk a little bit about my experience, but more so kind of lay out a framework that others could follow to execute the transition from another career into penetration testing. Uh, it was initially, you know, geared towards people who had been in the workforce for 10, 15, 20, whatever uh, amount of years. But I found that as I put this together, most of the advice that I have here is really applicable to anyone who wants to become a penetration tester. So Starting out, you know, the agenda for today, we're going to talk a little bit about what penetration testing is, just to make sure we have a common understanding and vernacular of the career field. We're going to talk about some of the reasons why people choose to get into penetration testing. And then we're going to get into the bulk of the, the presentation, which is laying out that framework for others who want to execute this same transition and become penetration testers. So I've broken it down into three phases. Uh, preparation is the phase where you're going to you know, build all the skills and make sure that you're qualified to do the job. Execution is the phase where you'll actually prepare a resume, apply for jobs, and interview for positions in the field. And then something a little bit different, but I think equally important, uh, the last is the survival phase, which comes after you have accepted a position. So in my personal opinion, like the transition from one career to another certainly doesn't end the day you get hired. Uh, you still have a lot of self-reflection and growth and change that, that you'll need to make to be successful in your new uh, career. So we'll talk about that and I'll provide some of the tips that I, I you know, of things that I learned along the way. And, and I, honestly, I did wrong. So uh, first, what is penetration testing? Optiv identifies penetration testing as authorized attacks to evaluate a system or application in order to find exploitable vulnerabilities for proactive remediation. Uh, that's a lot of big words. It's a great definition, but, you know, kind of in, in uh, more simple terms, uh, penetration tester is someone who is hired by another entity to attempt to hack into a certain set of resources, whether those are systems, networks, et cetera, to try to find vulnerabilities. And then at the end of that test, they write a report, provide a debrief of all the vulnerabilities that they found so that the client or customer can then remediate those vulnerabilities before a cyber criminal is able to exploit them. There are a couple different types of penetration testers. The one that I am most familiar with obviously is the consultant uh, because that is the role I fill at Optiv. But consultants essentially uh, work on behalf of a company that is hired by other companies to provide services. So for example, Optiv provides a full range of services including a whole menu of penetration testing options. Companies will pay Optiv for those services, and when they choose a penetration test, a member of the attack and pen team is assigned as a consultant to interface with that client, understand their requirements, conduct the test, 
write up all the vulnerabilities, any findings that they have from that test, and then to provide that report and that debriefing at the end to that client uh, so that they can remediate those findings. There is also uh, penetration testers that work on internal teams. And the best way to think about this, right, is there's large companies who, instead of outsourcing their penetration testing, they opt to hire a team to internally conduct those tests. Um, they're still working on behalf of a stakeholder. They're still doing testing. There's still a, a reporting function there. Um, but instead of being employed by another company and you know outsourced, they actually work for the company that they're testing. And then lastly, there is the freelancers. Um, kind of two types of freelancers. One is the 1099 employees who do uh, you know individual contracting and augment other teams. So a good example of that is consulting firms typically get really busy during uh, the fourth quarter of the year. These freelancers may, you know, if if the consulting company can't cover all of the tests that they have scheduled, they may pay some of these freelancers to take some of the work, you know, just on a contractual basis. They're not actually getting a salary per se from Optiv or, or from whatever company that they're, um, you know, uh, freelancing for, 1099, but they are getting paid to do a, a specific job from beginning to end. And then there's also the bug bounty her bug bounty hunters, which is a term you've probably heard of, but those individuals work through third parties and they test web applications. And if they find vulnerabilities in those web applications, they write up a report and they submit that to the company. And then the company reviews it and based on how valuable the company finds it, they can pay a bounty to that tester. So not someone, again, not someone who makes a, a regular salary by doing bug bounty hunting, but they get paid based on how successful they are in finding vulnerabilities and submitting reports. And then in addition to you know, multiple types of penetration testers, there's also a broad range of penetration tests. Um, this list is by no means all encompassing. It's just a few of the options that you should be familiar with as you try to get into this career field, right? Because this is the stuff that you'll see at an entry level or a, or a mid-level position. So first is your perimeter tests, which is testing all of those resources that are within scope that actually touch the internet. So you're doing that via the internet. And then there are internal tests where you're testing internal resources, you know, typically through a either being on site or sending a testing appliance to that location or sending a virtual machine to that location and connecting remotely. But you're, you're already internal to the network and you're trying to find ways that you can move laterally or escalate your privileges uh, to gain access to resources in that network. And then there's also application testers who, you know, test specifically web applications to find vulnerabilities, and they may go a little bit deeper than, than you would on those perimeter tests. They may do some code review. They may do, you know, much deeper testing to try to find vulnerabilities and improve those web applications. And then there's wireless, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's uh, testing wireless networks for vulnerabilities uh, to gain access to those networks. Social engineering covers kind of a couple of things, right? It's pretexting or, or doing things in person to try to fool someone into allowing you to gain access to something or to do that remotely, either via, you know, sock puppet operations or spear phishing, et cetera, in order to get a human being to do something that allows you access to a system. And then there's lastly, there is uh, physical penetration testing, which is basically just what it sounds like as well. It's trying to break into buildings through a variety of means. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why people choose to become penetration testers. It was interesting as I kind of, you know, researched this briefing and started putting together some slides. I asked a lot of people kind of how they got into this and why they're doing this. Um, and the, you know, the answers I got back were as varied as the, the people that work in this field. Um, but number one, you know, there's a strong career outlook over the next 10 years or so. The Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, believes that there'll be a 35 percent growth in the penetration testing field slash cyber analyst. They kind of bunch a few careers together, but that grouping of careers, they anticipate a 35% growth. There's also a large number of remote offerings. So if working from home or you know from a boat or wherever you wanna work is appealing to you, then uh, penetration testing is definitely a, a good field that provides a lot of uh, remote offerings. There's also, and this is one of my favorites, is the work-life balance, right? As a consultant, uh, most of the engagements that I conduct, I, I get the flexibility of 24-7 so I can work whenever I want to. So if I want to have breakfast with my kids, I might start later and um, you know end later. Or if I have an event uh, 
during the evening, I might start early so that I can finish in time to do that event. But incredible work-life balance and definitely something that I appreciate about the field. And then uh, penetration testing is both challenging and rewarding. Challenging, I, I mentioned this, but challenging in the sense that you're constantly learning. You can't stop learning or you're going to become outdated and you won't be relevant in the field because there's always new attacks, new technologies, new vulnerabilities. Uh, it's just a constant learning process. But it's also very rewarding. Um, you'll find that if you've ever done a capture the flag and, and you know, uh, gained access to a system that you weren't supposed to be on, uh, that pop in a shell, as we call it, uh, it definitely triggers a dopamine hit, and it's definitely something that is fun, and, and a lot of us keep doing this because we enjoy that reward uh, of, of popping a shell. And then there's also like a lot of opportunities for growth in the field. Um, like many fields, you're going to have some entry level, some mid, some senior. And then over the top of that, there's some sort of management structure. Um, <clears throat> as you progress through this, uh, you know, if, if, if your goal is to become the best penetration tester you can, you know, you may stay on a technical track and continue to grow as a pen tester. But if you want to do this for a while and try to get back into leading people or, you know, move into management, then there are opportunities there for that as well. So a lot of opportunity for growth in the field. And then lastly, and my, my personal favorite is you get to do things that would otherwise be illegal. Like I could not just go out and, and hack a you know, random company, even if my intent was honest and good. And at the end of it, I plan to tell them exactly what I found. Uh, they would be you know, perfectly within their rights to, to prosecute me, press charges if I um, you know, attempted to hack their systems without permission. So uh, definitely like to get permission first and stay out of jail. That's usually a, a top priority of mine. Okay, moving into the, the bulk of this briefing, right? Uh, my goal here was to lay out a process that others could use to execute a transition into penetration testing, and I broke it down into three phases. Again, these phases, the timing of particularly the first phase is a little bit, of, ar a little bit arbitrary. I put greater than three months, but I think in most cases it'll be much greater, right? And it'll be dependent on wherever you are starting from. So whatever skills you have, whatever you need to develop, if you're like me, I had, you know, I was way lacking on the technical side. So it took me uh, the better part of, of two years or two and some change actually to, to go from where I started to being ready to, to take on a job as a pen tester. So uh, definitely um, keep in mind that this is a little bit arbitrary, but these are the three phases and we're gonna talk about each of them in turn. The first phase is the preparation phase. And I think this is probably the most important for setting the foundation of your success in this transition and you're going to focus on a couple things here right we're going to conduct a skill inventory we're going to work on developing the skills that we need to develop and then we're also going to start to shape our personal brand so that we are more appealing to uh, hiring managers and others in the uh, penetration testing field so starting out with the skill inventory um, you've probably heard the term skill inventory but it can mean a couple different things depending on who's executing it like from the HR perspective, a skill inventory is understanding what skills are resident, resident on your team and where you can best use them. But when I say skill inventory, what I'm talking about is looking at the skills that are required in the profession that you would like to be a part of, as well as the skills you already possess so that you can compare those skills and identify areas where you need to improve and also so that you can identify where your strengths are so that you can um, you know, use those to make yourself more appealing during the uh, resume and application and, and interview process. So to do this, we're really gonna go through kind of three steps, right? The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the skills that are required for penetration testing. And then once we have a good understanding of those skills, we're gonna conduct a self-assessment and we're going to identify where we are on you know, a scale that we develop for those skills. And then with that, we'll identify some gaps. So here's an example of what I used. And this is actually a subset of a skill inventory list that was prepared by Philip Wiley and Kim Crawford uh, in their book, The Pentester's Blueprint. And in there, they basically lay out a, an, a, you know, like a 30 item, 30 or 30 plus item list of skills that are required to be a penetration tester. A lot of those skills are skills that you'll need after you join the field. They're not necessarily entry level skills. They're kind of you know, mid-level to senior level skills, but I tried to break down the list and kind of capture the things that I felt are the most important uh, for trying to gain employment as a, an entry-level pen tester. 
So as you look at this list here, I'll just highlight a couple. Windows and Linux, um, know that uh, the expectation there will be that you have like system administrator level skills in Windows and Linux, so you're comfortable with doing administration from the command line, navigating around the file structure, creating, moving, deleting files, et cetera. Um, not, it doesn't matter how great you are with the GUI, um, you're not gonna be able to use that graphical user interface uh, once you start getting shells on remote systems. So you definitely need to focus on having that level of skills for Windows and Linux. And then also for scripting, I put this on here because it is a very important skill. And as a penetration tester, you're gonna to have to be able to read Python scripts and read bash scripts and write bash scripts to automate some things. Um, but you're also gonna to have to be able to read other people's exploits and modify them as necessary to, to run them. So by no means do you need a computer science background or do you need to be a developer, or anything like that, but you'll definitely need some familiarity with scripting. And then the rest of the technologies on here, obviously you're gonna to want to be familiar with because you're going to be using those on a daily basis. So as you start doing this skill inventory, uh, basically how you would use this is you look at the skills on the left and then you do a self-assessment on the right and you score yourself as either basic, intermediate, or advanced. Uh, for me, I, I was pretty much basic on all of these things. I might've marked an intermediate just to, to save my ego, but I had a long way to go. So I knew that my gap was pretty much everything on this list. Um, and then you also do an inventory of your soft skills, right? Um, all of these skills, again, are things that are required to be successful as a professional, but especially as a consultant. You know, a lot of the jobs out there for penetration testers are in the consulting realm, and you're gonna have to be able to do these things. You're gonna be able to, to talk to people and write emails and write reports and explain technical subjects and manage your own time and all of these things, right? So do a, a self-assessment here. If you're like me and you're coming from a career where you spent a long time uh, you know, doing a lot of these things, then you're probably gonna mark yourself pretty high here and pretty low on the technical side, which is exactly where I found myself. But what that did, does for me is at the end of that process, I knew not only where I needed to focus on making improvements, but I also knew what areas uh, were my strengths so that I could carry those forward and use those um, you know, during the interview process as strengths. Once you've completed that, right, it's time to move into uh, actually closing those gaps that you've identified. So uh, we're going to look at three things, training, certifications, and experience. And these three are all very broad. So I I've put some recommendations down. I actually have a resource list for you that we'll talk about on the next slide. But just know that my lists are not all inclusive. They're just things that I've been exposed to that I think are useful. But, you know, training can come in a variety of ways. You may choose to get some books or take some courses or, you know, get to go on YouTube and watch some tutorials or go through a bunch of capture the flag walkthroughs. There are a number of ways that you can do this, right? But at the end of the day, you just need to start learning how to penetration test. And eventually you're probably going to get to the point where you want to take some sort of a formal training that will result in an opportunity to earn a certification. Um, Certifications are very important in the penetration testing world. And I say that because I think that the process for testing for certifications in, in this space is unique in that there are a lot of IT certifications that you can either you know, do some self-study with some written materials, some books, whatever, and, or go to a boot camp for a week and then at the end take a multiple choice test and, and you know, at the end of it, you know, bingo, bango, you're certified in whatever technology. Um, most, if not all, penetration testing certifications at least have a, a practical component where you're put into a lab environment and you're expected to show that you can you know, successfully conduct a penetration test on, on one or more machines. So I think that's very applicable. It shows that you've not only learned the things that you need to learn through training, but that you can execute them as well uh, in a certification environment. And then lastly, you know, once you've earned a certification, you're going to want to find a way to start building some experience. And this is challenging because obviously you're not going to get a job, um, but you're going to need to build some experience so that you can show that you are not only interested enough to learn and get a certification, but that you continue to learn and refine your skills and that you, know, you are appealing to a hiring manager. So some of the ways you can build experience is by you know, sitting or joining some of these uh, variety of, of 
capture the flag type labs that are available that have boxes available for you to just load up and, and try to hack. Um, you can write reports based on what you do there. You can do a number of things. You can also build a home lab, practice in your home lab. But the point is you're going to want to build some experience because you're not going to have work experience in the realm of pen testing when it comes time to apply for jobs. So you're going to want to have something that you can communicate to show that you've been doing the work necessary to improve. This is the list I talked about. Um, I started out trying to list all these things on slides and it ended up being a huge eye chart. But basically, if you go to oncyberwar.com, which is just a page where I keep a bunch of notes, um, up in the top left, there's a link for source zero con references. Click on that and it'll take you to a page that looks like the, the sample on the right hand side. And basically, I broke down you know, a bunch of references into training, certifications and experience. Uh, again, I don't you know, necessarily endorse any of them. They're all ones that I'm familiar with. I think they're all great. They're probably a lot more out there than I missed, but um, hopefully you find this useful and please use it. Um, also, you know, between now and, and Source SourceZeroCon, because this is obviously pre-recorded, I'll be updating the site as applicable to make sure I have the right list of resources. So uh, by putting it up on the web rather than in the slides, uh, it allows me that opportunity to, to keep changing it, modifying it and improving it. So um, it's there for you. Please use it if you choose to. And then finally, uh, the last step in the preparation phase, right, is uh, you're going to want to refine your personal brand. Now, that, that term gets a bad rap, like personal brand. People, you know, a lot of people don't really understand what that means. But, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos is quoted as saying that your personal brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And as you try to move into penetration testing, when you're not in the room, you want people saying that you're the right person for the job, right? So how do you use, you know, your how do you communicate that to the world, right? And there's really three ways, in my opinion, that, that I think you should do that. And the first is to start building your professional network. You know, I was a, a career intelligence officer, so until I decided to, to branch out, I didn't have a, a, a large professional network outside of the military. So I got on LinkedIn, I got on Twitter, I started interacting with people, and I just started to build my network to kind of increase my exposure uh, to, to other people that are in the field so that I could communicate that I'm interested. I also um, started to look for a mentor uh, in the field, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be directly, like you don't need a penetration tester to be a mentor because, you know, if you're coming from an, another uh, business vertical, you may not know any penetration testers. So it may be difficult to find one, but find somebody that's at least in cybersecurity that can be a sounding board. This is really important when you get uh, farther along into, you know, building your resume and, and preparing for interviews, but you want somebody who has exposure to, the area where you're trying to go to bounce ideas off of and just have somebody to talk to about what you're trying to do. And then lastly, you're going to want to work on your, your personal message or your personal narrative. Um, and for me, this came kind of in two forms. One, I put together uh, what everybody refers to as an elevator pitch. So a little 30 second blurb about me and what I'm trying to do. And then I also, you know, did some reflecting on the past and, and picked out some stories that, that I could use that would communicate, you know, some of the, skills that I developed while I was in the military, but also could communicate the exposure that I had to cyber operations and, and the reason why I wanted to be involved in this field. And I took those messages and I used it to both, you know, curate my social media so that I was expressing that I wanted to be a penetration tester. And then I also used those, you know, in, in personal interactions, particularly as I got to the, you know, interview phase of, of this process. Once, uh, once you're finished with all of those things, right, you want to, to move into what I call the execution phase. This one is a little bit more time bound. You're really going to start this at about three months out. Obviously, you could start working on your resume before the three month point, but, you know, applying and interviewing and stuff like that, it's, it's going to be a little more timely. So during this phase, you're going to be focused on three things. And I kind of just mentioned all of them, but you're going to focus on reframing your resume, applying for positions and conducting interviews. So first up, Reframing your resume. Obviously, I use the term reframe instead of create a resume because a lot of you will be coming from other career fields and you've probably changed jobs and you probably have uh, decent resumes. But you'll have to reframe your resume to shape it towards the jobs that you're trying to get, right? And the jobs that you're trying to get are entry to mid-level penetration tester roles, which, you know, based on what we did in the skill inventory, we already understand what is required for those jobs. So when you prepare your resume, make sure that you go back to that skill inventory 
and you highlight two things. Number one, you highlight all of those soft skills that you've already identified as strengths, right? Because that is essentially that's the value proposition that you bring. Like when when a company is comparing two candidates and they're looking at a recent college grad and someone who's been in the workforce for X number of years, uh, the person who's been in the workforce is going to have more exposure to certain things. So you're going to want to highlight those and capitalize on that on, on your resume. And then secondly, you're going to want to make sure that you capture your, your technical experience as it relates to penetration testing. So if you did have jobs that were related, make sure you highlight those with specific bullets. Like for me, I had some some jobs in cyber operations, so I made sure that I called those out because although it's not penetration testing, at least it was you know, s- somewhat similar and related to the field. And then also highlight, obviously, all the work you did in the preparation phase to get ready for this. So all the training that you did, all the certifications that you hold, and then also how you built experience after you gained that certification through you know, capture the flags or whatever medium that you used. And then lastly, you hear this a lot, but stick to one page. Um, it's hard for career transitioners to do so, but I promise you it's valued and you'll get good feedback if you can stick to one page. And then after you finish your resume, you're going to want to start applying for jobs. Um, this is an interesting time, at least it was for me, but uh, a couple things that will help you be successful. Uh, first and foremost, make sure you're tailoring your resume for every job that you apply for. You know, review the position listing, understand all the keywords, make sure you're matching those keywords. The goal here being that if there is a filter of some sort that you'll get past that filter and actually get a a human being to review your resume. And then also you're going to want to follow the instructions. Um, Some of these applications can be challenging, you know, with with repetition or, you know, some may want a a cover letter, some may not, but follow the instructions. There's no better way to self-eliminate than by, you know, ignoring the instructions of the, the HR team that's trying to hire somebody. And then lastly, you'll probably want to target about eight weeks before your start date to start uh, this application process. When I left the military, you know, my, my propensity was to start applying like six months out. But, um, you know, some, some mentors gave me some coaching and said, hey, that's way too early. People aren't going to hold jobs for you for that long. Wait until eight weeks. And I did. It was uncomfortable, but it worked. Um, you know, I was able to successfully execute and do some interviews and, and receive an offer and start exactly on my, my desired start date. And then lastly, uh, once you, you know, apply for jobs and your exemplary resume is reviewed, hopefully that will result in you uh, getting some interviews. And interviews, you know, if you've got experience with this, interviews are, are, you know, pretty standard across the board. One thing I found different here is you're going to want to expect multiple rounds uh, of interviewing. Uh, you'll probably have a tech interview, an HR interview, and a management interview. So be ready for those. Um, know what each will entail. And this is a good uh, area where you can you know, talk to your mentor about what kind of things you should expect. But when you enter these interviews, make sure that you're putting your best foot forward. Um, in the previous phase, I talked about you know, building your personal brand. Take some of those stories that you've already thought about and developed and use those you know, once, once you're in the interview. Tell stories. It's much more engaging than it is to just regurgitate the things that are on your resume. If you can, uh, you know, tell a story to whoever's interviewing you and get them interested in you as a person. And then also be humble and honest about your technical skills, right? You know that, yes, you've been doing a lot of work and you made a lot of improvement, but you, you've never been a pen tester. So you're still, you know, you still have so much to learn and, and, and just be humble about it and be upfront and honest about it. Make sure that you describe the preparation you've done, but still maintain some humility And then lastly, make sure you're ready for some of the common interview questions, right? You're going to get these every single time, so you might as well already have an answer for them. Uh, Questions to things like, tell us about yourself. Don't just regurgitate your resume. Tell some stories. Tell them why you're there, why you're interested, and, you know, what, what in the world drove you to wanting to be a penetration tester. And then, you know, tell us about a time when. These are pretty open ended, and they're going to be uh, questions designed to challenge you. It might be, Tell us about a time you disagreed with your boss or tell us about a time you had a conflict with a coworker, right? Be ready to answer that and answer it in a productive way so they know that, you know, you are able to interact with other human beings and that you've had challenges in the past and you've gotten through those. And then the last two, right? Why do you want to work here and why should we hire you? Those are pretty similar, but have an answer for them, right? You may not know why you want to work at a specific company. You may have applied to a whole bunch, but something as simple as, 
you know, I really am interested in being a penetration tester. I saw that you had this open role. It seems to fit my my skills and my desires. And through this process, I've learned a little bit about your company's culture, and I'd really be interested in joining your team as a penetration tester. It can be something as simple as that, right? I just came up with that like like here in person, but it doesn't have to be complex. Just be ready to answer it so you're not um, you know, caught off guard when it's asked. And then why should we hire you? The same thing, right? You're going to go back to um, really emphasizing your value proposition, so the skills that you have that others may not and then also the work you did to ensure that you're qualified to do the role, the work of a penetration tester. And then hopefully all of that will lead to you getting hired into a job. And um, like I said before, like this transition process doesn't end the day you're hired into your new position. It really starts and you really have a lot of, you know, self-reflection and change and growth that you're going to have to go through to ensure that you succeed at this job. So I struggled with this, I'll be honest, I mean, I struggled quite a bit with this because it was a big change for me. Um, so, you know, some of the things that I recommend you think about as you as you go through this process or as you join a new, a new job is to um, make sure that you get clear guidance, understand what it is your boss wants from you. Uh, in some cases, your, ba- your boss may want you to, you know, leverage your strengths and experiences to be a peer leader. And if that's the case, do, do your best to do so, but make sure that you know what is expected of you. Also, make sure that you set clear goals for yourself. Know where you want to go. Know what you want to be when you grow up uh, and work towards that. Um, You know, that may take some time after you join uh, a new team because you may have to figure out kind of the norms of the team, what's expected, what progression looks like, all that kind of stuff. Um, You can get some understanding of that during the interview process. But, you know, after you get on and you understand, um, you know, kind of the requirements for promotion or advancement, set some goals and start working towards those. And then uh, obviously you're gonna wanna leverage your strengths, right? You were hired because of that value proposition or in part because of that. Don't let that go out the window the day you get hired. Um, You'll probably feel a little bit like an imposter, I did. Um, I knew that I could communicate well, but I didn't know anything about penetration testing other than what I learned from, you know, doing a certification training and stuff like that. Um, But that didn't mean that I needed to to freeze up and, and not, you know, communicate well with people and and try to be the best that I could. So again, just leverage your strengths. Also share your experience. You've been through a lot of stuff. You got a lot of, you know, you developed those soft skills. You went through a lot of, of growth and development to do that. So share that if it's welcomed. Uh, you weren't hired to share that. So sometimes it'll be welcomed and sometimes it won't, but you know, you'd have to be a good judge of, of character and, and be willing to share those experiences when, when you can, when it's appropriate. Also, you gotta, I mentioned this before, but never stop learning. Like. Once you become a penetration tester, the job is just starting because every day there are new vulnerabilities, new zero days, new techniques, new tools that are made, all these things that you have to keep up on and you gotta be able to do them. So learn, 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 never stop. And then finally, find ways to fill connection gaps. If you're like me, um, I moved from a job where I had a lot of involvement in making day-to-day decisions that affected the future of the organization And I also had a lot of involvement and, you know, both formal and informal mentorship with people that worked with me or for me. Um, And I missed that, honestly, when I left the job, that those were the two things that I missed incredibly. And I had to look for ways that I could fill those gaps. So for me, I started, you know, trying to get more involved with uh, mentoring uh, veterans and helping other people who want to be pen testers. And that has, you know, in some regards, helped me fill that gap. But definitely, if you have those gaps, you know, don't... uh, don't ignore them, find ways to, to fill those and satisfy them. And then some of the things you're going to want to avoid, uh, they're kind of, you know, the opposite of the things you want to do, but don't live in the past, right? All your experiences led to where you are today, but it's not necessarily who you are, right? Your role has changed. You're here doing something different. You're expected to do a job. Don't be that, that person that's always like, well, in my last job, um, again, share the experience when it's warranted, but don't, live in the past. You're, you're now, you know, an entry level pen tester and, and that's who you are. That is, that is your sense of, of self. So definitely, uh, you know, adopt that and embrace it. And then also don't expect special treatment. Like you might be, you know, 20 years older than a lot of your peers, but that doesn't mean you, you're going to be treated any differently. Um, some of the best pen testers on the team that I'm on now are, you know, in their early to mid twenties and I'm in my mid forties. Right. So, um, but, we're either, you know, all consultant twos, we're all the same kind of pay grade, 
or in a lot of cases, they're, they're senior to me. So I in no way expect special treatment and, and you shouldn't either when you move into your new field. And then don't discount what or from whom you can learn things, right? Everybody on the team with the day you join is more experienced than you. So be willing to learn. Um, you know, a friend of mine used to say you have two eyes, two ears and one mouth and you should use them in that ratio. So be willing to listen, be willing to hear what people have to say and learn everything you can from everybody you can. And then, you know, if you do start to feel some challenges like I did, like don't suffer in silence, talk to your boss, talk to your leadership. Um, a lot of them have been around, they understand what you're going through. So just having somebody you can talk to is great. And if you don't want to talk to them, remember that whole thing about a mentor, that's another person that you can talk to. Um, I leverage both. I talk to my leadership and I talk to my mentor uh, outside of the organization to get me back on track. And, and I'm glad I did because it was very valuable. And then lastly, don't set unrealistic expectations. Like you come in with a lot of experience, but you're not just going to jump, you know, skip a bunch of, of pay grades and, and, you know, do things that are unrealistic. So, you know, understand what's, um, what's possible, what's out there and decide what you want to do and set clear goals to get there, but don't, you know, make them goals that are not attainable. So in conclusion, we talked about a lot of stuff today, but primarily we went over what penetration testing is and the reasons why people choose to pursue jobs in the field of penetration testing. And then we talked about my, you know, breakdown model of, of how you can execute a transition into penetration testing by breaking it down into three phases of preparation, execution, and then survival after getting hired. I appreciate you all coming to my presentation today. And if you have any questions, please, I'll be available on Discord. Um, I've also listed some of my other social media here if you want to reach out. And good luck with your transition. And thanks again for attending.